wanting a place to hide this weary soul This bag of bones I tried with all my might I just can't even fight I'm slowly drifting Over the vine He 
We're going to get to witness right now a testimony of God's faithfulness. I want to invite you to be seated. Coming already now in the water is Giovanna. And Giovanna. Good morning. Is passing on her faith today to the next generation because right after she gets baptized, her son's gonna come and get baptized as well. How you doing, Giovanna? I'm doing, I'm doing great. I feel a lot better now that I'm in this warm bathtub. <laughs> you told me it was gonna be warm, you're right. I did. <laughs> A lot more, the warmers, the water's a lot warmer right here, right now than it was when Jesus got baptized himself. <laughs> Have you accepted Jesus as your personal Lord Absolutely, and eternally. 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 Well, it is our joy now to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Reza, hey, baby. how you doing, buddy? Good. You see grandma. Do you remember there. how old I am? Grandma and Nani over there. Do you remember how old I am? Yes, you are 48. That's correct. <laughs> We're like the same because you're eight, right? <laughs> right? You have some friends and family here today supporting you? Yes. You want to wave to them? You want to wave to them? Your mom is so proud of you, and we're so proud of you today. I'm gonna ask you a question. Have you accepted Jesus as your savior, your eternal savior? Yes, I do. We baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. take their time in and out of that very slippery tub, and Vincent is coming next to be baptized, and uh, Vincent, uh, in front of your family and friends today, it's, it's so good to be with you and to support you. Have you accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. Vincent, we baptize you now in the name of the Father, our God, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to clap, but when I do, it sounds like this. And Michael, our sound engineer, is shaking his head saying, don't do that. So I'm trying to... Mark, I got to meet you a little bit earlier. Uh, you have some friends and family here to support you today? Yeah, yes, I do. Well, this community as a whole wants to support you as well and uh, ask you this question. Have you accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Mark? Yes. We baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, that's four folks now. We've got four more who are getting baptized right now. This is a brother and sister, uh, Aiden first. Aiden, do you see your family? Yeah. Out there? Aiden, how old are you? Twelve. Twelve. Well, you're, you're way more mature than uh, Reza. I can just tell. I'm, I'm making a joke, which was not funny at all. <laughs> Reza is a very mature eight years old as well. But you're 12. And uh, have you accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? I have. That's awesome, man. Aiden, we baptize you now in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Aiden's sister, Kara, is coming now. 
now? Are you the same in age as Aiden? Or no. Are you, are you, you're, you're older? Yes. Yes, of course you are. And how old are you? 14. 14. And do you see your friends and family here today that want to support you? Have you accepted Jesus as your forever savior? Yes. I baptize you now in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. get to ask you this question. Have you accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. We baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And now coming into the water is Elizabeth. Hi, Elizabeth. I just want to give you a moment to look out and see the people that love you and that are here to support you today. Have you accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes, yes, I have. We baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Can I get a hallelujah? I know the choir was here raising their hands and leading us in praise, but praise God from whom all blessings flow. Hallelujah for each and every one of these people that got baptized today. Hey, I want to invite you to stand up for a moment. Would you say hello to the folks around you? Greet one another, enjoy today, and then you may be seated. I'll be looking for you this time. Well, good morning. My name is Robert, and I'm one of the newer pastors on staff here at WAC. I almost wore a shirt today that says, WAC, since a month and a half ago. <laughs> it's great to see you, whether you're in the room here or out on the patio or listening in online. If you're new, we'd love a chance to say hi to you. And if you're on site here, you can go uh, to Guest Central in the lobby, or if you're listening online, you can click on the link new here, and we have a gift that we'd love to give to you. So yesterday, here on campus, we celebrated our second annual sports jam here at WAC, and it was amazing. Uh, so many people came out to celebrate the sports ministry here at WAC. They got a chance to hear uh, great testimonies from the athletes that were here, and just celebrate this incredible ministry that is taking Jesus to the community through sports. Speaking of that, let's give it up for our worship team today. You know, they, uh, they gave so generously of their time last night at, at Sports Jam and then came back to be with us again today. So thank you. It was absolutely wonderful. Well, VBS is almost here. When we're going to have about 400 kids on this campus just eagerly learning about Jesus as they follow through on the theme, finding the way. And, um, you know, the thing that makes VBS go are volunteers who give so generously of their time. It takes over 350 volunteers to pull off VBS. And some serve for one day, some serve for the whole week. Okay, I got in such trouble at the 930 service because I gave the age of my mother-in-law who signed up as a volunteer. I don't even, I'm in so much trouble, I don't even want to go home. Can, can I come to your house after service to watch baseball or golf? So anyway, my very young mother-in-law has signed up. So if you'd, yeah, yeah, she's just a baby. So if you'd like to sign up, you can go online and there's a link there that you can click and we would love to have you on the team. Well, two weeks from now is Father's Day. 
Now, where are all the fathers in the room? Yeah, I know you're here because there ain't no football going on right now. So, I don't know what your dad plans are. Maybe mow your, mow your lawn, make some carne asada. Uh, you know, maybe uh, change the oil in your car, if that's how you roll. I don't roll that way, but good for you if you do. We'd love for you to make WAC part of your Father's Day plans. One, we've added some elements to the service that are going to be so fun to, to unpack. And also, every guy on campus is going to get a chance to get hooked up with their own bottle of Dad's Root Beer. You don't want to miss that. So, we're hoping you make Father's Day at WAC part of your weekend. You know, as we go to our, our time of giving, since I've been here just the last few weeks, I've been blown away by what God is doing at WAC. Whether it's the number of people that are regularly being baptized, declaring their faith in Christ, what God is doing in the lives of our young people, as in VBS, or a ministry like, like the sports ministry of WAC that is, that is literally sharing Jesus in places that, that, that people would never dream of hearing Jesus about. They're taking Jesus to the community through sports. Now, when we give, we are actually partnering with God in what he's doing here at WAC. And so thank you in advance for your faithfulness in giving. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these, your people. We thank you for what you're doing here at WAC. And Lord God, we pray that as always, everything gathered through this offering would translate to lives being changed, hearts being transformed by the precious love of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Is it on? 
What do you think, um, when you think about taboo topics, what, what topics are taboo? Well, discrimination, one. Religion, another one. People don't want people to impose their beliefs on, on other people. Politics. Kids, uh, teaching them responsibilities. Everybody is so stuck on social media all the time. People just decide not to talk about that. I feel like I can't talk about that. Yeah, we should talk about it. Let's, Let's talk, talk about, about it. it. Oh, that was it. Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry, you guys had to watch that video week after week. I apologize. I'm like, <laughs> luckily, next week is the last week of Let's Talk About It. Pastor John will be back up here. Uh, my name's Adam. Hello, I'm a junior high and young adult pastor here. It's such a great honor to be here with you guys. Um, we're gonna continue our series of Let's Talk About It. And um, we're just gonna jump right into it. Uh, one more time. Can we give it up for the choir, man? They were like amazing. The worship team. That, that was an experience. Uh, if you were able to make it out to our sports jam last night, it, it was just a, an awesome, fun time. And they brought that same energy and it was so cool worshiping with them and with you guys here. So it's just, it's just great to be here. Um, when I was in high school, I played basketball. And my junior year, we got a new coach. Um, he, he brought an assistant coach and they were, they were gonna revamp the whole program. Because the year before, man, we were awful. We, I think we won one game during league. Um, and so we, we wanted to get better, obviously. And so they, they were bringing this new system, this new culture. They used words like philosophy. And, and I didn't understand what that means because I was just like, hey, let's just play basketball. But they were trying to create something there. And it was fun and I enjoyed it up right up until the point where they made us run cross country as we prepared for the basketball season. That was brutal and that wasn't fun because I hate running. But they, they were really intentional in how they were like, hey, this is what we're gonna do to the basketball team. We're gonna create these young men and we're gonna train them and we're gonna teach them to be good basketball players, but also good, uh, good citizens, good, good, strong men. And I'll never forget the thing that they told us. They said, hey, when you go out there, put that jersey on, you're representing two things. You're representing the front of the jersey, which is the name of your school, right? I went to Whittier High School. Um, we got a couple Cardinals in the house, all five of you, shout out to you. Um, so he's like, we're representing your name, the school. So we represented Whittier. And then he's like, they said, you represent the name on the back of your jersey. And so my last name, Delatore, you represent your family and you represent your school. And we're like, oh, okay, like we can get behind that. So the way that we conducted ourselves, the way that we played on the court, the way that we conducted ourselves off the court in the hallways, we tried to embody what they instilled in us. So we were representatives, the Whittier High School basketball team. And I, I, I had a great time being on that team. Um, if we think about it though, our lives, we kind of live our lives in that same way, right? So we all have a last name, so you represent your family. Maybe if you have a job, you represent the company that you work for. Maybe you're your own boss and you get to establish the norms and uh, of, that you wanna set out for your company, right? And so when you work for a job though, maybe it's Apple, Google, maybe you're a teacher, maybe you work for church, you know, wherever you find yourself working, you must fall in line with the, the policies, the culture that they have set out for you, right? And when you do that, you're gonna thrive in the environment that you work in. The company is going to thrive. Think with me about companies that do a good job doing this, like Disney or Disneyland, right? When you go, you know the experience that you're gonna get at Disneyland. It's the happiest place on earth for some, maybe not so much for others, but depending on who you are, you're gonna love Disneyland. When you go to In-N-Out, I love In-N-Out, I'll always use in and out as a sermon illustration. You know the type of burger you're gonna get. You're gonna order in the double-double, maybe with onions without, some chopped chilies, and you know that it's gonna taste amazing. You're gonna get treated with kindness and respect, and you know what to expect when you go there. This same idea translates over to our faith. When you make a decision to trust God, you make a decision to follow Jesus, we become representatives of the King and His kingdom. Right, we are entrusted to represent Jesus, the King, the Creator of everything, and this is a beautiful, um, this is a beautiful thing that that we get to be, uh, uh, that we get to do, that we the, the creatures that we get to be, that God entrusts us with this responsibility. There is one glaring truth staring back at us, though. Sometimes we as humans don't always do a good job at representing Jesus, if we're honest. In fact. Sometimes the way that we represent Jesus or maybe have had represent, a Jesus represented to us can actually bring harm to others. 
I'm not, I'm not talking about like making mistakes, you know, uh, committing a sin, because we all know we're all imperfect and that is going to happen. I'm talking about claiming to be something or someone other than who you really are. And I know this can be a sensitive topic because there are people here who have been harmed in the name of Jesus or Christianity. And if that's you today, I just wanna let you know that I'm glad you're here and I'm praying and I'm confident that God will meet you and speak to you today in this, in this very room or if you uh, are watching online or out on the patio. So as we continue our series, let's talk about it. Today we're gonna to look at hypocrisy that exists in the church. This is a very fun topic that I get to preach about. Um, but we're gonna talk about it. All right, so since the beginning of the year, the Barna Group, they've been releasing studies based on a series titled Spiritually Open. And in it, they've been looking at spirituality in America, the idea of Jesus and the church. And they've asked, um, they've asked people of faith, people outside of the Christian faith, so people of other faiths and people of no faith. They've asked them their opinions and their thoughts on Jesus, on the church. And the answers were interesting. They yielded results that um, there was this openness to who Jesus is, right? But when it came to the church, the answers kind of started to shift a little bit. And it was really interesting. So I'm gonna share a little bit of their findings. So when they asked Americans uh, whether they have a positive or negative view of Jesus, 71% view Jesus positively. That's a cool thing, right? Um, in addition, 63% of, of those that were interviewed said that they made a commitment to Jesus, to follow Jesus, and that commitment is still important. It has meaning to them still to this day. When the questions moved beyond Jesus, though, the positive opinions they began to diminish and shrink. And so they categorized them, th their findings in Christian, other faith, and no faith. And they discovered that the number one reason for people doubting Christianity was hypocrisy amongst Christians. That's the number one reason people outside of faith and other faiths are kind of um, repelled by the Christian faith. It's the hypocrisy that exists in the church. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge that uh, hypocrisy in the church has been a barrier to some receiving Jesus and receiving the message of Jesus. It's hurt the work of the church the message of salvation, hope, love, grace, and truth, right? It's, it's, it's distorted it. The hypocrisy in the church has distorted this beautiful message and has changed it. Think with me, if you will, about the pastor who gets up in the front and preaches Jesus, opens up the Bible and turns to the scriptures and preaches about God and forgiveness and grace. But behind closed doors, they bully, they intimidate, they... they, they Hoard and Lord power um, amongst their congregants and their staffs. They treat people way outside of how Jesus wants them to. What about the apologist who has published many works, goes on to speak and represent Jesus, and, and, and um, they create these arguments for the existence of God and why you should be a Christian? Well, simultaneously, there are these accusations of um, inappropriate text messages with this person and a number of women or touching women inappropriately or spiritually abusing the, um, people who follow them and work for them. What about the congregate that shows up to everything, every Bible study, every activity, and, and they come and they just look like, you know, they're the perfect Christian. But when they, when they leave here, they might be struggling secretly with um, ab abusing substances and the way that they speak to their spouse and their kids is anything less than Christian. Like, what, what do we do with these, the, these, these conflicts that we have? Like, we wanna follow Jesus, but we, we can't ignore these, these things. Um, there are Instagram accounts, YouTubes, podcasts, journalists, outlets that de they, they devote their entire energy to kind of exposing these things. And, and I think sometimes they take it a little too far that like, okay, well, what are we trying to do here? But it is interesting to note that um, Jesus' harshest words were for religious people who claimed to follow God, but inside they were different. They didn't really follow God. In Luke 13, 15, Jesus heals someone on the Sabbath and the people in the synagogues that are there, they start muttering and they're like, why is he healing this woman on the Sabbath? And Jesus says, 
Hey, you hypocrites, you bring out the don- your donkeys and your oxen to water on the Sabbath. Why should not this daughter of Abraham who has been bound up by Satan for 18 years, why shouldn't she be set free? You're missing it. He called them hypocrites. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, hey, when you give to the poor, don't be like the hypocrites. And they, when they give, they want everyone to notice. They're like, hey, look at me. I'm giving to the poor here, announcing their charity. He says, they have received their reward in full. And when um, Jesus and his disciples are questioning like, hey, why aren't you following the Jewish traditions here and washing your hands before a ceremonial um, um, uh, meal? Jesus, he looks at them and he points out the holes in their arguments in Matthew 15, seven through nine. He says, rightly did Isaiah prophesy about you that they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And so what, what do we do with this disconnect that exists from the way that people who claim to follow Jesus, what they say, and is when it's different from what they do? So the question we have to answer is, how, how do we overcome hypocrisy? It's, it's, it's a big topic. It's a big topic, right? It's probably affected us. It's probably affected us, maybe personally or someone maybe you admire from afar. So we, the, first, the first way I wanna suggest is we overcome hypocrisy by accepting truth. And this specific truth here. Um, back in the early 1900s, there was a, a newspaper, the London Times, they, they posed this question to a famous uh, thinkers and writers. And the question, the question was, what's wrong with the world? And there was, there was um, a, an author and he, he responds just very succinct and short. And he says, dear sirs, I am. I am wrong. I am what's wrong with the world. And he says, sincerely yours, G.K. Chesterton. So th- this man, he got it, right? He, he understood uh, of his, his uh, sinful nature. And I think this is a place where we need to start today. Um, so in the book of Romans, Paul discusses in the first two chapters, our state, our sinful state, our, our, rebellious, um, our rebellious nature, the fact that we are drawn to worship the, cre- the creation rather than the creator. And he, he ends up in Romans 3.23, which tells us, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He doesn't end there though. In verse 24, he says, and and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. And so he goes to tell about this life that is available for those that are under the the curse of sin, the, 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 the disease of sin. He says, there's this life that is available through faith and through confession one that is marked by gentleness, goodness, peace, kindness, faithfulness, self-control, and love. He talks about that in Galatians as fruit of the Spirit. And so today I wanna wanna differentiate between um, these these two different categories here. Because if we were to go out to lunch or maybe grab a coffee, maybe go eat it in and out after the service, we'd have a conversation. And I'd say, you know, we're all gonna sin, right? We are all going to make mistakes. We're all going to do something that's less favorable, that's, that, that does not represent Christ well. And, and that's okay, there's grace for that. That's not what I'm talking about today. Well, I'm talking about those that proclaim to follow Christ. Yeah, there's, there's no evidence of Christian maturity. There's this real, being a real follower and then being pretenders. And so that word hypocrite comes from the Greek word hypocrites, which means one who pretends to be something other than he is, or more literally, an actor. You just act. You put the mask on and you pretend to be in a play um, because Shakespeare said, right, all the world's a stage. And so some people take that literally. And so I think it's important to note that Jesus in Matthew 23 had some really harsh words for people who pretend to follow Jesus or pretend to follow God, uh, pretend to follow the way. And see, he he lists out a a few things here um, in the way that hypocrites kind of uh, affect um, those that wanna follow them. So in Matthew 23, Jesus says, he's addressing Pharisees and says they, and scribes, he says, they shut the door of heaven in people's faces. He says, you can't come in, Uh uh-uh. 
He says, they make converts into children of hell the way that they procl- the pro- the proclaim and they profess. Hey, f- this is the way to, to following God. Jesus says, if you follow that, it's the wrong way. They tithe and they give, but they neglect justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Outside they, they are clean, but inside they're filthy, they're dirty. They are like tombs dead inside. And so once again, Jesus had the, these, these harsh words to those who pretend, who claim to follow God. And so overcoming hypocrisy, we have to say like, hey, there's the truth that we have to accept that, that we are prone to sinfulness. We are prone to falling short, but that's not the end, right? Because there's this beautiful thing that we don't need to just stay at our broken sinful state, but by God's grace, we can move towards growth. There is idea, there's this idea called spiritual formation where your life actually starts to look like Jesus's life. Um, in his book, Renovation of the Heart, Dallas Willard, he offers some insight on how to grow in the way to be formed by Christ. He asserts that um, in order for a believer to be spiritually formed, there's this pattern that must happen for all of us. So if you want to be like Jesus, not just attend church, but your character is shaped and formed. There's three things that must happen. There's these words here. There's a vision, intention, and means. So you, ha- you must have the vision of seeing what life can look like in the kingdom, right? And Jesus demonstrates that. Life in the kingdom is goodness. It's submitting to the Father. It's loving your enemies, praying for those who persecute you. Literally, it's not just this abstract idea, but when you're wrong, you can forgive someone, right? Jesus hung on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they are doing. The people that were murdering him or killing them, he is asking for forgiveness for them, right? So it's this vision of living in the kingdom and you must have the intention. Anyone ever had the intention of working out? Maybe eating healthy? Right, we, we all do, I have that too. I have the intention of, to stop eating hot Cheetos, but some, something is preventing me from doing that. My wife and I, we, we, you know, we watch a show and we, we, we snack there. So I need to have that intention, but now I need the means. Jesus had the intention of submitting to the Father's will and living a life empowered by the Holy Spirit. And how did he do that? Scripture tells us he woke up early and he went to his secret place and he prayed. And he studied the scriptures and he went to the temple and the synagogues. And even as a young boy, he studied the the way of his father. And so for us here, we need to have that means, right? Whether it's showing up to church, listening to the preacher, when Pastor John comes up here, and you can listen to me too, and hopefully you get something out of today's sermon. Maybe joining a group, living life in community, being a part of a small group, a Bible study, right? Studying the scriptures at your own place where you live, so your character is shaped and it's formed and it's changed. And that is a great way to combat hypocrisy because when you can live your life and say like, hey, I, I might mess up, but I know day after day, I'm getting better. And I'm actually, my life is starting to look like Jesus's life where maybe I struggled with this and now I can actually look at my wife and I can forgive her because I was harboring resentment for the longest time. And I don't know what that is for you, but this is a great way to overcome and battle hypocrisy by living our lives in this way. So another way we can overcome hypocrisy is by living selflessly. So by accepting truth, and then we get to live selflessly. Turn with me if you have your Bible, it would also be on the screen to Acts 4. Um, Shout out to my friend, Brian Guthrie. Um, I had, I was, I had shared in the last service that I was having trouble, you guys, I think I need glasses. I had a Bible and I was trying to read it at the traditional service, but I was squinting and I gave up and I went to the screen. Brian's like, hey brother, let me help you out. I got the large print Bible. So shout out to large print Bible. Some of you have that on your phone. I I do as well. So, and I think I'm gonna have to get glasses. Anyways, Acts 32. Man, this is amazing. Large print here. Um, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it 
at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to anyone who had need. So God was at work in a mighty way after Jesus had ascended into heaven and the church burst onto the scene. What was happening is what Jesus said was gonna happen. They received power when the Holy Spirit came upon them and they started to become witnesses for Jesus. They started preaching the resurrection of Jesus, the crucified savior. They were preaching the gospel. Uh, the text tells us that God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that nobody was in need among them. They weren't coerced, they weren't forced to do this, but they started selling their property and their land and saying, hey, these people can benefit from this. We have an excess, a surplus, so use it. It tells us that they were of one heart and with one mind. They existed in the spirit of unity that was knit together by the power of the Holy Spirit. God was working, you guys. He was doing amazing things. Have you ever been a part of a team where you're just like, man, something is just clicking this team. Maybe it's a class, a cohort that you're a part of. Maybe it's a sales division that you're a part of, a sports team that you're a part of, the family that you're a part of. You're just in sync. You guys are after one goal and you're accomplishing it. You're just clicking. You're like, man, life is good. We are accomplishing all that we are setting out to accomplish. What happens though when you enter into someone who, that, that doesn't have the same mindset? The negativity, the selfless, maybe the selfishness starts creeping in, right? What happens then? I wonder if this is why Jesus said in Luke 12, one, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Why? Because that grows, it spreads, it can infect and so you have this, this, this narrative in Acts 4 of God is moving, there's unity, one heart, one mind. And then all of a sudden, several verses later, it changes. Something happens. We're introduced to these characters, Ananias and Sapphira. In Acts 5, it says, now a man named Ananias, together with his wife, Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. Hey, that was the thing to do. You have excess property, let's sell it. With his wife's full knowledge, though, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest to, and put it at the apostles' feet. Here we have Ananias. We're introduced to Ananias, who's in the area when you know, the church is bursting onto the scene. We don't know what is prompting him to do this. Maybe he's feeling pressure. Maybe they have a lot of money. They're like, hey, this is kind of the thing to do. Honey, I have an idea. We're gonna sell this extra piece of land. We're gonna give it just like people are doing here. But we're not gonna give all of it. We're gonna pretend and pass it off as we are, you know, being these selfless people, these generous believers, but we're gonna keep back some of it for ourselves. And she's like, oh, that's a great idea, babe. Yeah, like we, you know, we're gonna need that money. And so they, 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 they come up with this plan and they put the money there and they're like, well, why, why? why? Why would you do that, Ananias? Like, you're missing it, bro. You're, you're just missing the point. And so God is not pleased with this. So much so that his judgment is going to be very, very harsh. And so we're gonna go ahead and read on. That Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart? You remember where Satan filled Judas's heart and he goes and betrays Jesus? It's the same language, this strong. How is it that Satan has filled your heart that you've lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you receive for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? Like, hey, you didn't have to sell the land. Nobody forced you to do this. He said, and after you did sell the land, wasn't the money at your disposal? Like you could have done whatever you wanted with that money. You did not need to, to lie and be deceptive in this way. He says, what made you think of doing such a thing? You have not just lied to human beings here, but you also lied to God. Your actions have affected this way and also this way. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. And so Peter is fired up and he's like, Ananias, why would you let Satan influence you in this way? You're, you're lying to God. The, 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 this greediness that you have in your heart, this greed, your love of money, you didn't have to do this. The, the land was yours. The money was yours after you sold it. Why, why? Why did you do that? You lied to your, us here and you're lying to God. 
If Ananias really was transformed by the message of Jesus, this new life, he would have just put the money there. But no, he held it back and he wanted to pass off um, himself as being a good person, a generous person, someone other than he is. He put the mask off, or the mask on, so to speak. And so he, what, what was at stake here, friends, was the, the integrity of the unity that was being formed that we read about in chapter four. God was like, hey, I'm not going to let this infect what's happening here. And so I need to stop this. That's why people believe, that's why his judgment was so harsh. And so Ananias was messing with the, the, um, the reputation of the church. He passed himself off to be his holy, but it, it was just one big lie. He was being a hypocrite and, and he received judgment because of that. If you go back, there, I, I didn't read this though. If you, there's two verses at the end of verse four that stand in contrast to what Ananias did. And I wanna read this here. Um, we, I, I forgot to read that. So they carried his body out, sorry. Um, let's go, was it two slides forward? Um, no, it's the, uh, it's Acts 4, 36. I think I messed you up, I apologize, tech team. Um, so in Acts 4, right before we get to verse five, it says, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So before we're in introduced to Ananias, we get this man named Joseph who gets the nickname Barnabas. Why? Because he is a son of encouragement who did the exact same thing that Ananias did, except he did not hold anything back. He was sold out and he places the money here at the apostles' feet and it's, it's that, it's period. There's no hidden ulterior, no motive. And so I wanna encourage us today to reject the temptation that, that we might be drawn to Ananias when we appear to be something other than we are, but let's be sons and daughters of encouragement like Barnabas was. Because when we do that, friends, we can get out of the way and say, hey, there's this barrier here that, that is created because of hypocrisy. But no, we, when we get out of the way and we are humble, we are transparent, we're sons and daughters of encouragement, then we kind of, we, we, we open up that path for believers or non-believers who are seeking and, and we give them a path to uh, the freedom to, to question and to explore what it means to follow Jesus instead of being kind of uh, pushed away. Okay, so uh, my encouragement is to, to, for us, all of us here, myself, to be a Barnabas not an Ananias. And so we can overcome hypocrisy by, by um, walk, or my mind always goes blank when I'm trying to recap the, the thoughts here. Um, accepting the truth, and, and that's one way that we can do it. Living selflessly, and then the third way is overcoming hypocrisy by walking in humility. Jesus tells a parable in Luke 18 when he, he, contra he contrasts two people there, a Pharisee, and a sinful person, a tax collector. Let's go on and, and just read it. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and, one, and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people, the robbers, the evildoers, the adulterers, and even this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. He's like, God, I thank you that I have it good on the outside. And he's pointing to his righteousness being these external factors. He's like, I thank you that I'm not like this person, right? That's one way that you can be a religious person. And Jesus offers another way. He says, but the tax collector who is a thief, who is a traitor to his Jewish brothers and sisters, people despise, he stood at a distance and he would not even look up to heaven, but he beats his breast and says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner, period. Jesus says, I tell you that this man rather than the other went home justified before God. Why? For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And so my charge to us today is to embody humility. 
Humility is hard to embody though in our culture in the West, isn't it? Because sometimes, why do we need to be humble? If we're CEOs or we work for a good company, we have a lot of money, maybe you know, we, are, we come from a good family, life is good. We might not be dependent on Jesus or on God for anything. And so approaching God in this way where God, I need you, and it's a daily thing, and we do that humbly, that can be a challenge. But humility says, God, I can't do it alone. And so if we were to look at all of us here, maybe some of us struggle with things that we haven't told anybody about. Pride would say, I'm gonna go to church, I might sing, but then I'm gonna go home to my home, and I'm gonna wrestle with these things in private, in secret, and I'm not gonna share about that with anybody. Humility says, friend, I can't do this by myself. And we start to become transparent about our struggles where, hey, I'm struggling with this. I could use support in this area. Things aren't good in my marriage. I just got let go from my job. I'm doubting in my faith. I need help. It's this posture that says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And how many of us are thankful for God's amazing grace and his mercies are new every morning. But there's this difference where we can say, God, I need you. Friend, I need you. I need support in this. And so I strongly believe that the antidote to hypocrisy is just humility, transparency, saying, God, I, I need you. I need you. And so I believe and I'm confident that overcoming hypocrisy is attainable. The harsh truth is that it starts with you. It starts with me. We can accept the truth that we are vulnerable to sinful practices and attitudes and words and things because we're human and we have breath in our lungs. We can guard ourselves from hypocrisy though by accepting that truth. Hey, we need God's grace. How many of us here have been impacted by someone who has claimed to follow Jesus but it maybe has caused you harm? This next one is a little bit harder to say. How many of us here have maybe caused harm in the name of Jesus or or, or religion or Christianity? When I was a young man, I was a Pharisee. I would look at people and I judged them based on nonsense things. I had no grace, no love in my heart, no room to accept people, but I looked people and I looked down on them. I grew up in the church, man, I knew all the answers. I knew the Sunday school jargon and I could say, I can quote scriptures, but I had no love in my heart. I was a Pharisee. And I can say that with, not that, oh, God has healed me from my Phariseeism, but I've learned when I had an encounter with Jesus, the floor the, is just level at the cross. And I need his grace and his mercy every day. I'm no better than anybody else. As a matter of fact, like Paul said, I am the chief of sinners. And I don't mean that with a hint of irony, like I mean that truthfully. I wanna close with this. Maybe you're here and maybe you have been hurt in the name of Jesus or Christianity. Maybe it was your former pastor who put this yoke on you that was, is not a part of the way of Jesus. Maybe it was your former spouse, your former significant other, a family member who hurt you in the name of religion, hurt you in the name of God, hurt you in the name of beating the scriptures over you and said, what are you doing? Get your life together. But the grace, the mercy and truth, the love was not there. If that is your experience today, friend, I wanna say I'm sorry that that happened to you. I'm sorry. Jesus never spoke harshly to sinners. He loved them. He offered them a new way. He embraced them. It was those that claimed that they had everything together and they were close to God and on the outside, Maybe their life looked away, but in the inside, it was dirty, it was unclean. And so if that's you, I know that God can heal. If you've been hurt, if you've been harmed, I know that God can heal you this morning. 
and we're gonna have people up here that wanna pray for you if you wanna process. Maybe it was something that happened years ago when you were a kid. Maybe it's something that's happening to you now and this is your first week here. We have people that wanna walk alongside of you, pray for you and just love you. And if you're here and maybe when we talked about the, the research at the beginning, you're like, hey, that's me. I used to be a Christian or I used to follow Jesus, but man, I couldn't stomach all the things that I saw go on in, in church. I just wanna say, I'm glad you're here. And if you have questions, your questions are welcomed here. You can come talk to me. I don't have all the answers, but I'd love to have a conversation with you. We can overcome hypocrisy, but it starts with us. It starts with one, and that can spread to our families, our Bible study groups, our schools, our jobs, our churches, our cities, and God can do amazing things just like he's done in years past. Amen. <laughs> hey, would you bow your heads? And let's pray together. God, we acknowledge that harm has been done in your name and that's not right. If there are those that, that have done that and need to repent, God, would you just lovingly convict them of that way? Draw them to your heart, Father. God, if there are those who have been harmed in the name of Jesus that have been hurt, would you heal their hearts? Start that process this morning, Lord. Would you just... Give them the courage to come up, to talk to someone, to receive prayer, to receive love. God, if there's someone here who is maybe kind of on the outside and like, I'm curious about Jesus and I wanna know more, but man, this has been a barrier for me. God, would you just remind them that, man, your son spoke out against those tendencies, those ways, those beliefs, and that their questions, their wonderings are welcome here. God, help us to embody the way of Christ so we can fight back, fight against, push back that hypocrisy that exists. Yeah, we know we're gonna mess up. We know we're humans, we're sinful. And when we do mess up, help us to acknowledge it. Help us to, to ask for forgiveness from you, Father, and from those that we have harmed. Thank you, Lord, because we know that you are gonna enter into this fight with us. We know that you are gonna lead us and you are going to empower us by your Holy Spirit. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for making a way. Thank you that we don't just have to stay in this state where, yeah, we're sinners, but you offer salvation through the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus. Thank you for loving us, God. And we in turn love you back. It's in your son's name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Friends, thank you for being here this morning. Would you be blessed in Jesus' name?